Mr. President, I rise today ahead of the Senate's vote on Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson to be a, a justice on the United States Supreme Court. There are few responsibilities the Senate has that are more important than confirming judges and in particular confirming justices on the Supreme Court of the United States. The Supreme Court is charged with the responsibility of defending and upholding the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. It is charged with the responsibility of, of, of upholding the rule of law and protecting your rights and my rights. Now, Judge Jackson is someone that I've known personally for 30 years. She and I went to law school together. We were both on the law review together. Judge Jackson is someone that, on a personal level, she's smart, she's talented, she's charming. I've always liked Judge Jackson. But the responsibility given to the Senate is to not to make an assessment on a personal level, but rather to assess a nominee's record and the kind of job they would do for the position to which they've been appointed. Now, many Democrats in this chamber and their cheerleaders in the corporate media insist that we cannot examine Judge Jackson's record. They insist, in fact, that any scrutiny of her record, any difficult questions directed her way, and certainly any opposition to her nomination must, must, must be rooted in racism or sexism. Sadly, this is a common talking point for Democrats. Whenever anyone disagrees with them on substance, you must be a racist. If you're not a socialist, you're a racist. That's their standard go-to, and in this instance, all should acknowledge and should celebrate the historic milestone that would be having the first African-American woman serve as a justice on the Supreme Court. Given our nation's troubled history on race, that is a major and important milestone. I would note, though, that the Democrats celebrating that fact, patting themselves on the back, there's more than a little irony in their celebrating that fact. Because the reason that we have not, to date, had an African-American woman on the Supreme Court, a major reason, is that the Democrats who are so proud of themselves filibustered a qualified African-American woman nominated to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Her name was Janice Rogers Brown. She was a justice on the California Supreme Court, and 20 years ago, President George W. Bush, a Republican, nominated her to the D.C. Circuit. And Senate Democrats realized that a qualified African-American woman on the D.C. Circuit was a real threat to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. And Janice Rogers Brown is a conservative and a constitutionalist, and for Democrats, that was unacceptable. And so Democrats filibustered Janice Rogers Brown. Chuck Schumer filibustered Janet Rogers Brown. Joe Biden filibustered Janice Rogers Brown. Dick Durbin filibustered Janice Rogers Brown. Pat Leahy filibustered Janice Rogers Brown. Dianne Feinstein filibustered Janice Rogers Brown. So now all the Democrats who are celebrating putting the first African-American woman on the Supreme Court have them th themselves to thank for that because it could have happened 20 years ago. But in Senate Democrats' way of viewing things, if a black woman or a black man or an Hispanic woman or an Hispanic man dare to disagree with leftist orthodoxy, they do not count. Indeed, it was not just Janice Rogers Brown. Democrats also filibustered Miguel Estrada to the D.C. Circuit. Miguel Estrada, an advocate with suburb credentials, were criticized, as the staff for Senator Ted Kennedy wrote at the time in internal memos, quote, 
they should filibuster him, quote, because he is Hispanic. Mr. President, this was before your time and my time in this body. But here's what Ted Kennedy's staff told him. They, quote, identified Miguel Estrada as especially dangerous because he is Latino. That is racism which the Democrats put in writing, if you're black, if you're Hispanic, we will target you, we will filibuster you, we will block you, and that's what they did. And for that matter, that's what Democrats have done for three decades now to Justice Clarence Thomas, one of the greatest justices to ever serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. And yet, in Democrats' minds, he is not a black man because he dares disagree with their leftist ideology. It's wrong. It's racist. It's cynical. And it's offensive. What we should be doing, what every senator should be doing, is examining Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's record. Her actual record. If you look at her substantive record, it is far out of the mainstream. It is an extreme record. If you look at her record, I believe it demonstrates that Judge Jackson, if she is confirmed, will be the single most liberal Supreme Court justice ever to serve on the Supreme Court. I believe she will be to the left of Justice Sotomayor, she will be the left of Justice Kagan, and she will be way, way, way to the left of Justice Stevens Breyer, the justice she would be replacing. What does that mean as a practical matter, left and right? Why do the American people care about the Supreme Court? They care because they care about their rights. As a practical matter, what it means, I believe the odds are nearly 100% that Judge Jackson would vote to overturn the case of Heller versus District of Columbia. What is that case? It is the landmark case that upholds the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms, a fundamental protection for all of us. That case was decided five to four. Judge Jackson, I believe, is a vote to overturn that case to take away our Second Amendment rights. And that means every senator who votes to confirm her is voting to take away the Second Amendment rights of Americans. Judge Jackson, I believe the odds are nearly 100% that she would vote to overturn the Citizens United case. What is Citizens United? It is a landmark case that protects our right to free speech, our right to speak in the political process, to support candidates, to oppose candidates, to express our views and participate in democracy. Citizens United was five to four. One vote away from being taken away. By the way, Mr. President, in the Citizens United case, the Obama Justice Department argued that the federal government has the power to ban books. Case was five to four. There were four justices willing to go there. Judge Jackson, I believe, would support the assertions of government power to silence you, to silence me, to silence the men and women we represent. When it comes to religious liberty, I believe Judge Jackson will vote consistently over and over again against the religious liberty of Americans against our right to live according to our faith, according to our conscience, one of the most precious rights, the very first right protected in the first clause of the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. That's what our framers thought about it, is that without the right to seek out and worship the Lord God Almighty with all of your heart, mind, and soul, no other rights matter. And I believe she will consistently vote to undermine that right, and in particular, one of the applications of that right to the context of school choice. School choice is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. 
If you care about civil rights, if you care about advancement and opportunity for young kids, for young African American kids, for young Hispanic kids, there is nothing, nothing, nothing that matters more than school choice. And yet the Supreme Court, in the case of Zellman versus Simmons Harris, upheld Ohio's school choice program by one vote, five to four. I believe Judge Jackson would vote to overturn Zellman versus Simmons Harris and vote to strike down school choice programs across the country. You know, one of the problems with politics today is members of this body like to avoid accountability for what they're doing. But everyone in this body is on notice that this is a justice who will vote to take away our free speech rights, vote to take away our religious liberty rights, vote to take away our Second Amendment. And that means every senator that votes for her cannot avoid responsibility for those lawless outcomes. When it comes to abortion, Judge Jackson's record is extreme. I believe she would vote to strike down every single restriction across the country on abortion. I believe she would vote to strike down prohibitions on federal partial birth abortion, a truly horrific practice opposed by the vast majority of Americans. The Supreme Court upheld the federal ban on partial birth abortion by a vote of five to four, one vote away. Judge Jackson, based on her record of being a radical advocate for abortion, will consistently vote to strike down reasonable restrictions. All of those are extreme positions. But if you want to understand just how extreme, there was one portion of the confirmation hearing that I thought spoke volumes. When Senator Marsha Blackburn asked Judge Jackson, what is a woman? Now, Mr. President, what is a woman didn't used to be a trick question. 115 men and women have served on the Supreme Court, and all 115 of them would have no difficulty whatsoever answering the question, what is a woman? Not so Judge Jackson. Judge Jackson's response, I can't define a woman. I'm not a biologist, was her defense. Now, does that really mean that Judge Jackson doesn't know what a woman is? No, of course not. What it does show is her sensibility that she is completely in line with the radical left that wants to redefine what a woman is and erase it from the dictionary. You know, yesterday, a reporter stopped me, a reporter from a left-leaning publication, said he was asking every Senate Republican on the Judiciary Committee the following question, what is a woman? You could tell from the expression in his face, he thought this was a great gotcha question. I looked at him and said, an adult, female, human? And he looked at me astonished. And he said, did you look it up? He said, that's actually the dictionary definition. I said, no, I just speak English. If you'd like another definition, how about this one? A homo sapien with two X chromosomes. For all of recorded history, people have known what a woman is. But Judge Jackson is such a fellow traveler with the radical left that she cannot acknowledge common sense. There's a reason the radical left groups in this country pressured the Biden White House to nominate Judge Jackson because she was the most extreme of the nominees being considered. There's a reason they pledged millions of dollars to support her confirmation because she is the most extreme of the nominees being considered. Let me give an example of just how extreme. In the written questions, I submitted a question to Judge Jackson that says, quote, the theory that humans possess inherent or inalienable rights is reflected in the Declaration of Independence, which states, 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you hold a position on whether individuals possess natural rights? Yes or no? Judge Jackson answered, quote, and this is in writing, I do not hold a position on whether individuals possess natural rights. Mr. President, that is a radical statement. Our country was founded on the quote I just read from the Declaration of Independence with those words that Thomas Jefferson penned. We declared our independence from Great Britain. We declared that we were our own nation. We started a revolutionary war. We drafted a constitution based on the proposition we hold these truths to be self-evident. They're not evident to Judge Jackson. She doesn't hold a position that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Judge Jackson says, she has no position on whether you have a right to life. She has no position over whether you have a right to liberty. She has no position over whether you have a right to the pursuit of happiness. If you're a modern leftist, if you're a socialist who wants the government to control every aspect of your life, every aspect of your freedom, then a judge that has no view on whether we have natural rights is exactly the kind of judge you want. And by the way, to understand how radical her opinion is, you can look at the Make the Road decision. This is a decision in her court as a district court that was challenging the Trump Department of Homeland Security's deporting people illegally in this country. The statute under which the secretary was removing illegal aliens explicitly gave the secretary discretion and said that discretion is unreviewable in federal courts. It was as clear and explicit an authorization and a removal of the authority of federal courts to second guess the policy determinations. That didn't stop Judge Jackson at all. She ignored the plain text of the statute. She issued a nationwide injunction to stop the federal government from removing illegal aliens. Her decision was so extreme that on appeal, it was reversed by the Federal Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit unanimously. This is a left-leaning court with a majority of Democrat appointments and unanimously, the D.C. Circuit reversed her because she ignored the plain language of the statute. But there is no area that is more extreme than Judge Jackson's record on crime. This was the central focus of the confirmation hearing, and her record is far, far, far out of step with the mainstream. When it comes to crime generally, nationally, the average for federal judges sentencing criminals is 45.1 months. That's the average sentence nationally. Judge Jackson's average is 29.9 months, 33.8% less than the national average. If you're a criminal, you want to be in Judge Jackson's court because you're going to get a sentence more than a third less than you'll get in the average district court. That is far out of the mainstream. As you know, Mr. President, there was considerable focus not just on her leniency on criminals, her leniency on violent criminals, her leniency on sexual predators, her leniency on drug dealers, but there was a particular focus on her very disturbing record as it concerns child pornography. When it comes to child sex offenders, it is a truly grotesque problem we face in this country. I spent a number of years in law enforcement, 
as the Solicitor General of Texas, I worked on many criminal cases. There are no cases that were more disturbing to me personally than the cases where people abused kids, where they hurt kids, the evil, sick predators who carry out unspeakable acts on little children. And I have to say, when I first heard that there was a concern about her record on child pornography, I thought, come on now, that, that can't possibly be the case. Who is soft on child pornography? That didn't sound plausible. Then I examined her actual record. I examined the cases. She had roughly a dozen child pornography cases as a district judge. In every single case where she had discretion, 100% of the time, where she had discretion, she sentenced the defendant way, way, way below the federal sentencing guidelines and way, way, way below what the prosecutor recommended, the very liberal D.C. prosecutors. Now, when this issue was first raised, the Democrats responded, well, federal judges across the country sentenced defendants below the sentencing guidelines, especially concerning child pornography. And that claim, insofar as it goes, is true. But her record is not simply sentencing below the guidelines. It is sentencing way, way, way below prosecutors. And then we examined how does she sentence in child pornography case compared to other federal judges? Let's compare apples to apples. When it comes to possession of child pornography, the national average for all federal judges is 68 months, a little over five years. It's a serious crime with a serious prison sentence. Judge Jackson's average is 29.2 months. Now note, the national average sentences child porn offenders to a longer sentence than your typical crime. Judge Jackson sentences child porn defendants to a shorter sentence than your typical crime. When it concerns possession of child pornography, it's a 57% difference. But it's even more disturbing in a second category, and that's distribution of child pornography. Distribution of child pornography, the national average is 135 months, 11 years. Long time for a horrific crime. Judge Jackson's average sentence was 71.9 months. That's a full 47% less than the national average, but it's even more egregious than that. When you understand that with distribution of child pornography, Congress has passed into law a minimum sentence of 60 months. So federal judges have no discretion to sentence below 60 months. That's the bare minimum. When you look at that, you realize that judges across the country, and we're not talking just Republican judges, we're talking Democrat judges, Bill Clinton judges, Barack Obama judges, Joe Biden judges. They sentence on average 75 months longer than the minimum. Judge Jackson sentences on average 11.9 months longer. It is a consistent and disturbing pattern. Now, why does she do this? Well, when you sit down and read the transcripts of her sentencing hearings, which I have done, it is disturbing stuff. When you read the transcripts, she's very explicit that she has clear policy concerns. Under the sentencing guidelines, there's a stricter sentence for child pornography involving very young children. She refuses to apply that. There's a sentencing enhancement for child pornography involving sadomasochistic abuse of children, children being tortured. She refuses to apply that. If you look at what she has said, she says to the prosecutors, this is a quote from Judge Jackson at a sentencing hearing in United States versus Cain. She says, you're obviously aware, she's talking to the prosecutors, you're obviously aware of my policy disagreement. I just think it's very, very hard to deal with number of images 
as a significant aggravator. Now, what does this mean? There are two other aggravators for child pornography. One is use of a computer. The other is the number of images. In case after case, she refuses to apply them. On use of a computer, she says, well, at the time the guidelines were passed, this crime was primarily carried out through the mail. Now everybody does it through a computer, so I'm not going to use an enhancement for a computer. Now, Mr. President, I don't agree with her on that, but I understand that point. That point is not out of the mainstream. But there's another aggravator, an aggravator up to five levels for the number of images. And over and over again, she says she won't apply the number of images. I asked her at her hearing, I said, so you're saying that somebody who has videos of a thousand children being sexually abused and somebody who has an image of one child being abused, that those are the same crimes that you shouldn't punish the one offender more than the other. She refused to answer that question. That is extreme. It is radical. And that's not the law. Her disagreement, I would note, I believe I have 25 minutes and Senator Thune extended the uh, had a UC to change the time. The Senator has used the 25 minutes a lot. When it comes to Judge Jackson's record, it is far out of the mainstream. This is a judge who has a justice. The odds are 100%, I believe, she will vote to strike down the death penalty nationwide. And she will rule repeatedly to release violent criminals, to release murderers, to release sex offenders. This is a pattern that is highly, highly disturbing. Our Democratic colleagues like to say they don't support abolishing the police. When you nominate and confirm judges, that let criminals out of jail, you have the responsibility for the consequences of your actions. Judge Jackson's record is extreme, and I urge my colleagues to vote against her confirmation.